Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is Claudia Monticelli, the host of this podcast, Let's Talk Soul. Over the years, after having interviewed so many people on so many different topics, I realized that what interested my audience wasn't really the individual topics per se, but was how it impacted them, how it touched their soul. So I'll invite you all to lay back, put your feet up, and if you like what you hear, leave a review, five-star review. I'd appreciate that. So just enjoy your listening. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Claudia Monacelli, your host for the podcast, Let's Talk Soul. And you should be used to my voice by now. (laughs) So um, these episodes come out twice a month, as you know. And uh, every two weeks, I have a guest. And we usually talk soul. And talking soul has many different colors from all walks of life. And today, we have a guest, Jahan Khamsezadeh. Jahans, please say hello to our audience. Hello, Claudia and audience. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. He is speaking to us from California, and it's the first time I've ever met him. So uh, let me take it slow as I introduce uh, himself. He's a man after my own heart, a PhD. He He completed his dissertation on psychedelics. And this is the first person I've ever met that has a PhD in uh, that topic. Um, He's written a book, and I will put all of this information in the description of the episode. He earned his master's in consciousness. Here, too, it's very rare to find consciousness and transformative studies from John F. Kennedy University. Now, here, too, I've met three on my show who had a degree in consciousness. Um, Now, let's see what can, uh, uh, well, I've been talking academics, but aside from his academic work, he's um, undergone, he's undergone several major trainings, including uh, graduating from uh, the two-year Institute um, of Training concerning Mazatec mushroom tradition, which I don't know uh, about anything about, but we'll ask him. And he's assisted um, various different centers doing research on psychedelic theories and re- and different types of research, getting certificates here, here and there. So I'm not doing justice. So I do invite you to go read the uh, episode description, which is much better than I'm doing now. Um, uh, Jahan, I, I see that you have a website, you have your book. And um, let me start by, um, because I, you know, it's, we talk about spirituality and consciousness and are they the same? Is the soul uh, consciousness? Can we, is there an overlap there? But before we go and dive into that main topic, um, like everyone, uh, everyone, I say it broadly, but I've dabbled in not psychedelics, but in drugs in general okay psychedelics i'm not exactly sure what they are can you give us a a lay uh, definition for those you know tell it to us as if we were children yeah totally you know it's it's a very broad field but one way to describe it is uh psychedelics are chemical catalysts that expand consciousness and uh, many of them grow naturally in nature. But are they? You know, there's if they thousands grow, of plants. Yeah. But if they grow naturally, you say they're chemical yeah. catalysts. Why? I don't usually well, put chemicals. Totally. With so, yeah. Well, chemicals are. That's what we eat. Uh, everything's made of chemicals to some right. degree. Right. Okay. And so, including all plants, all fungi. And so, I'm saying there's chemical catalysts is because there's certain molecules in there. And again, pretty much all organic materials made of molecules, including mm-hmm. our bodies. Mm-hmm. Um, also our 
same with our transmitters. And so there's certain chemicals found in plants and fungi, and there's yeah. also some made synthetically that mimic our neurotransmitters okay. in our brain and fit into the receptors in our brain, and they tend to fine tune and shift um, our consciousness. Well, now that that is in and of itself is a remarkable, remarkable thing. Okay. Um, the work I do um, aims at drawing out the characteristics and gifts of certain soul groups of origin when they appear on the earth mm. to help shift our consciousness. How did a nice boy like you get into a field like that? Yeah, <clears throat> I had a life-changing mushroom experience at mm -hmm. um, 18. No, before you, that, I was you suicidal, were depressed, and atheist. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and I had this experience of uh, connecting with God. And again, mm -hmm. I was an atheist, so that seemed very remarkable at the time. Mm -hmm. And this one experience kind of showed me that consciousness pervades everything. Yeah. That love's the most important thing in the universe, then followed by learning everything else insignificant compared to these two values. Mm -hmm. And that we're all deeply interconnected. And so this 90 minute experience through which I was just crying the entire time because I'd never felt this level of depth and love and expansion mm -hmm. before radically changed my life. Um, and so then I, I dedicated my life both to love and learning and to the study of consciousness. And that's taken uh -huh. me down many routes. Of course. And after maybe 13 years into academics, um, you know, I became very clear that psychedelics were the most transformative experiences in my life. Mm -hmm. And now the research, decades of research, also seem to correlate with that. They correlate it's, it's that, yeah. The, yeah, the, okay. yeah, yeah. Sixty-five percent of people in the right set and setting have a mystical experience. Mm -hmm. Eighty percent of people with treatment-resistant depression heal. Mm -hmm. It heals near of end-of-life anxiety. Eighty percent affected for alcohol addiction, the highest method we have, mm -hmm. and nicotine addiction, OCD, and yeah. I think a variety of more things that we're just beginning to research into. Okay, so now let's say. Um, when I did my PhD uh, um, in social linguistics, um, oh, I was, okay. you know, I came with a project. I went to my supervisor and he says, oh, well, then how can I help you? As if, you know, he had nothing to do with that. I, I said, well, I want to study something that has far ranging um, effects and the importance. And I laid it on and he said to me, you know, why don't you start? studying consciousness that'll keep you going for the rest of your life and i and i didn't get what he was saying at the time but i understand now <laughs> okay yeah, now totally. so we have the psychedelic experience and that just brought you to where you are today and of course um that has opened you to uh, your spirituality Okay. Now, when we talk about spirituality, what is that for you, Jahan? You know, if I had to boil it down, it is that sense of interconnection, of unity, of oneness. Um, so as opposed to we're isolated experiences on our own little island. And when everything's interconnected, then something like love becomes very important. And I think normally we can group with spirituality that there's higher orders of um you can say intelligence or being that we're all connected through a larger consciousness, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's one way if I had to say the common characteristics of what it is. And, and there's different ways to work with spirituality. Some people it's through rituals, right? Very much mm -hmm. in their body. Some people it's through prayer and emotion. Some people it's through cognition, like learning things conceptually. Yeah. But something I see that psychedelic spring, because they do tap into all those is direct experience where, spirituality doesn't necessarily have to be theory anymore you know with certain compounds you could take them and as wild it might sound to some people see spirits and see beings and of you're course. shot out through the entire universe of course. So there's a of strong course. visual component mm -hmm. but a strong um, intuitive component where some part of you really wakes up and just recognizes what you can say is like these large truths shared through all the mystical right. traditions and religions yeah let's just go back to consciousness a moment um you mentioned spirituality and while you were talking you said expanded consciousness there's you know as many people as you talk to they will talk about consciousness in a different way similar to the way they conceive of the soul now i, I i'm going to put you on the spot but uh, 
can you uh, try to put into words your best distinction of consciousness? Yeah, first, let me also give that context to what you're saying. It's it, it's generally an elusive word. You know, I remember yeah. once looking it up at the dictionary and there was seven very different kinds of definitions. Yeah. Right. And getting like my um, both the masters and the doctors in different schools on consciousness, I see the abstractness on it. And so the context in which you say it really matters for some people, it's just your attention. You know, and some yeah. people it's just self-reflective, aware thought. Yeah. And for me, Awareness. it's very universal, right? And it definitely kind of grounding in this idea that we are all one large being an organism. Wait. So that there's like a fabric. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. So when you're saying, you, you mention a lot of parts of that definition and the mind comes up, you know, as if consciousness, if you had uh, some kind of a diagram uh, consciousness was through in the middle, one of the spokes out of this mind map would be the mind or thought. And uh, like you say, it is generally an abstract concept, much like the soul is an abstract conscious, uh, concept. But consciousness, is consciousness available at a soul level with no embodiment. Now, this is something that is hard to fathom. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, yes, in the sense of like you can encounter disembodied kind of beings and there's a larger, I'd say right. a unitary type of consciousness that's part of the fabric of reality. But also mm -hmm. I'd, I'd say it's an intricate part of matter. So one philosophy I, I, I tend to really resonate with is known as panpsychism. Mm -hmm. And it's really putting forth that consciousness is developing alongside matter since the beginning of the Big Bang, through yeah. atoms, through molecules, through mm -hmm. cells. Otherwise, we look back and you're like, at what point did consciousness arise? Yeah. Like, how does subjective experience and mind come out of matter? And the only real solution to this is that it had been there all along. So as matter kept increasing in complexity from atoms to molecules to cells to these bodies, consciousness also kept expanding. Mm -hmm. and so it's it's part of the very fabric of all of reality. You can't get away from consciousness. It's, it's embedded in everything. Okay. I'm going to ask you a personal question. You don't have to respond if you don't want to. Do you have some form of a family or extended family, inner family, children, yourself? Yeah, I have um, I have you know parents, and I have a sister, and I've been able to hold journeys for them. So it's okay. been I was a beautiful experience of bringing them into this world. That yeah. you were responsible for tiny beings, if you had children or were in contact oh, with my children. Want to one day, but no, I don't have children. Oh, do you know people? No do you have very close friends who have children that you oh, are? Yes. Uh, you yes. come into contact with. Once in a while, not not very often, uh -huh. but I've been around children before. Okay, so so let's see that we're talking, we're aiming these um, these these notions, this these suggestions. I guess some people ask, what would you tell your five year old Jahan? But what I want to know is, if you could give a teaching or a suggestion to little human human beings that are under the age of ten, what would you not teach them, but have have them experience or tell them some secrets you know uh, uh you, many of the things you just said uh, could could be responded yeah. but. i guess you know what it kind of does kind of boil down to in many ways is love and so okay. to teach them to be loving and to have their yeah. heart be the compass in which they make decisions and i see love as the most intelligent force in the universe. You know, yeah. we tend to think the heart's always at war with the mind. No, it's not. Mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. not what's going on. It, it's we're here to serve love, and that's that is the intelligence that connects us and moves us forward. And so, I would clarify that, uh -huh. so, so they don't lose themselves and later okay. have to go to therapy so, because they've mm -hmm. abandoned their heart and kind of closed it down. But keep moving from that place because if your heart's open that's where we can get to experience more of the soul as, as you mentioned mm -hmm. when we say soul mm -hmm. it tends to have a very heartfelt depth experience You're right so i, I wouldn't that. want them to abandon and lose that part of themselves and to help mm -hmm. cultivate the expansion of that part of their being mm, that would be another spoke of the the mind map the heart <laughs> and love of course um you just mentioned therapy not having them uh, be exposed to therapy at that 
young age. I'm, it may not be the therapy that you wanted to, to talk to talk about uh, or, or that you listed for me as a topic you'd be willing to discuss, but therapy, uh, you sp- mentioned right before the age of 15, you were in a very bad, uh, 18, you were in a very bad way. And that's when you had your first psychedelic experience. Had you had any forms of therapy before that first experience? I did not. Uh huh. And successively, again, I, as I talk to people, it's a very personal experience. You don't have to answer. As you grew up, did you feel the need for some form of therapy? Yeah. So the honest answer is, my parents were both immigrants and uh-huh. illegal for a while, and so there was a lot, of, a lot of social economic problems. Yeah. So therapy wasn't necessarily something of that was course. accessible or part of sure. their culture. So I thought looking Jay back, had... it would have been good for me. I yeah. thought you were going to say my both my parents are therapists, <laughs> and I thought, oh no, I asked I him the wrong question. <laughs> it would, that would have been nice. No, no, they didn't believe in therapy. It wasn't a part of their culture. They, yeah, they couldn't. It wasn't something they quite could have made sense of at the time. I got off the boat. My parents um, immigrated to the United States, and I was five months old. And I literally got off the boat oh, in wow. Ellis Island. So I know something about that. <laughs> I know how yeah, you know yeah. the growing up and the parents always busy doing something, and they talk to us in Italian, and we talk to them in English, and you know we had our own code. Yeah. So I mean, who, who is mm-hmm. who's so stable that they live in one place today? Um, now, mm. therapy. You listed it as a topic, and I was wondering why. Well, that's I have a lot of training there, and that's a big part of my private practice. And what job. kind? Um, what kind? And Give us some tangible yeah, so, examples. Totally. So what I can talk about, you know, I've been holding legal psilocybin ceremonies in Jamaica, and while I'm over here, I lead preparation and integration work for people inquiring. So, I. It's not just a biased approach, but again, I've seen these medicines to be the most effective form of yeah. therapy because they can get deeply into the unconscious I see. I and see underneath kind of... language. And I studied somatic therapy for two years, and it yeah. gets right to the muscle memory yeah, while holding somatic. trauma. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so I've had I've had clients say that I got more out of one session than twenty years of therapy. Of course, of because course. It, it gets underneath all their barriers. Skin, and yeah. so. Mm-mm. I mean, that's why I listed it, because that is my training. And it's yeah. also therapies, the main way that psychedelics are coming into culture. It's because of the therapeutic applications that they're moving towards federal legalization here mm-hmm. in the U.S. Oh, geez, um, I can't wait. In about two years. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, do you uh, do you have colleagues? I mean, you, you said my practice. My Do you have um, other people who do the same work that you do that you know? Many. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So I don't, I guess just the way my work, uh, the work I do, I don't see them as competitors. Everyone has their little niche and they do something different. Mm. Are these people you studied with or you you know because of the circles you travel in? Oh, it's both. I I studied with many and trained with many and others. Uh They're they're deep friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely no competition at all on the sun. Uh Interesting. Do you like to support each other? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what it's all about. You couldn't say right. otherwise after yeah, yeah. all of the, <laughs> well, this Dutch cousin, we are one, you know, <laughs> it was a stupid question. On right, that. right. Um, right. Uh, no, when, um, well, let me start by asking, do you like living in California? Have you lived in, in any other place in the United States? You know, I grew up in Tucson, Arizona, but mm-hmm. I, I moved here for the degrees. Uh, there was yeah. too many places where you can study consciousness academically. So yeah, that's I what know. brought me here. And then I, I fell and then I fell in love with the culture. Um I live in like the psychedelic hotspot where like so yeah. many of the organizations are. And it, we're in the SF Bay area. It's kind of leading in terms of technology, of politics, of, of spirituality in this world. And so I kind of the cultural climate. You, you know, like, that it's kind of very progressive, keeps me here very much. Well, so. the climate is not bad either. Um, yeah, totally. <laughs> We're lucky in that regard. Yeah. yeah. Um, I grew up on the East Coast. Half of my life was spent between New York and New Jersey. So um, 
I, I traveled as an interpreter for the State Department, so I traveled all over the United States. And oh. often I'd have to go to California. Every time I went to California, I couldn't take it. Because, you know, in New York, ding, 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 ding. We go there and I'm thinking, these people are sleeping, you know, while they're standing up. Uh-huh. And, of course, you know, people from Washington State say the same thing about us, that we, we try to, um, you know, uh, take everybody for a ride. It's it's very interesting. The United States has a wide range of different um, characteristics and people. I, I I mean, it, so there is that kind of I hear it a lot from people from the East Coast that maybe you paraphrase that people are a little more relaxed over here. Oh yeah. But that being said, we are hyper productive. You know, oh, we have one no, of the biggest no, economies definitely. in the fucking world. And yeah, sure. in terms of tech. And sure. So even though we just. There's just a little bit more of ease. In the oh, no, no. I, I mean, I'm living in Italy. <laughs> you know, I, it's... I love Italy a lot. I, and that was one of the many reasons I almost wanted to live there was that yeah. people wake up, they have their espresso, they have the wine in the evening. There's yeah. a lot of community. You know, I felt yeah, a deep a peace being in Italy. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. You know, there's a, a, a double-edged sword. Um, it is, well, having come, come, having come from the United States, you know, where am I? But every time I cross the pond here, um, let's say many, many years ago, I was the first thing, one of the first things that put me off in this country was that people knew your business. You know, there was just too much, too much. But then I got used to it. And even Italians are mimicking Western cultures in having that distance, uh, the running around mm-hmm. from day to night, drinking one too many espressos, you know. But uh, you're yeah. definitely right. You can't get a bad meal. The wine is definitely good, and it's Aww. not that expensive. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I love it. Yeah, I want to bring our attention to a topic that you might be of interest, given right. if I understood right, your doctorate was in linguistics? Social Did linguistics, yeah. Right? Yeah, so I'd love to talk about a theory concerning psychedelics and linguistics, you know, to kind of really attune to your interests of yours. And so the topic of my dissertation was this idea put forward by Terrence and Dennis McKenna that Mm -hmm. it was perhaps psilocybin mushrooms that catalyzed the consciousness in humanity that we went from primates to Uh these beings with this level of intelligence Mm -hmm. because um, mushrooms that grew in the area where our primates evolved. Mm -hmm. And the idea being simple, there's a conscious expansion. So there must've been a chemical that did that in the environment, very simplistic. And there's a lot of anthropological evidence and neuroscience Mm -hmm. that supports this idea. But the idea that Terrence also really put forward that our linguistic capabilities emerged because of psilocybin mushrooms through a type Mm -hmm. of synesthesia, the same Mm -hmm. way you know, different senses get conflated with this, you know, if people may be familiar with synesthesia where all of a sudden people can taste something, but they see a color or mm-hmm. they touch a sense that they see, see a sound. So at some point, thought, meaning, symbols and sound got conflated and yeah. we had the emergence of language. Yeah. All right. Um, you mentioned the somatic importance of something that that you do, that you feel literally under your skin. Um I am a social linguistic a linguist, but to this day, I still see it as a, a mystery. Um, social linguistics uh. is the study of language in a context. And so it's actually not the culture. We don't call it culture. But culture is like consciousness. You know, you talk about culture, you could talk mm-hmm. till the cow- cows come home. But um, language is so... Uh, very, very context oriented. Now, when you talk about mm-hmm. um, psychedelics and how they influence, I'm not sure if you mean the way we lo- lose like la- the way we use language or the way um, we produce language based on the intake of psychedelics. I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that. What you meant by your last. Comment. Yeah, what I'm meaning is that the emergence of language and origins of language itself yeah. was catalyzed by psychedelics. Okay. So I'm talking about yeah, early early humanity. Yeah. You know, okay. That, so that, so... Th- that also that that art itself, art and creativity uh-huh. and the way the culture, the beginning mm. of culture as we've come mm-hmm, to know it, mm-hmm, was mm-hmm. stimulated by early use of psychedelics. All right. Can I? Um, I'm going to ask you two more questions. One is um i'm i'm in both 
these questions. I'm a client, okay? Uh, I come to you because I have an emotional block. I'm starting to literally lose my mind. I'm not sure of uh, my beliefs anymore, and I'm not sure, uh, sure of uh, my abilities you know, here I am, a PhD, blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden, big crisis, right? And so I meet you and I come to you. That's the first, let's start with that question. Is there anything you can help me with based on your expertise? You know, down the grape, a friend of a friend told me about you. Yeah. So so my my is the anatomy of our consciousness and psyches across humans are somewhat the same, the same way everybody has two arms, two legs, a heart, two lungs, you know, so biologically we, we're somewhat the same, Similar. small variations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, so that, that translates to our psyches too. So there's certain universal just needs. And so a model I love is Maslow's hierarchy, just because it's simple and, and mm-hmm. it's pretty on point. So Can you explain it a lot us? of times people, they, yeah, so normally it's seen as a pyramid, but he meant yeah. it to be a little bit differently. And there's a hierarchy, a developmental stages of different needs that are trying to be met. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And if a stage isn't met, it takes our focus. Um, and so at the bottom stage is like food, air, water, shelter, like basic survival needs. And then after that is safety. Mm-hmm. So a person needs to feel safe or else that's mm-hmm. going to take all their attention. Yeah. If there's guns being shot at you, sure. you know, if you're under threat, that's going to take your focus. Then after safety and security is belonging. So we have this inherent feeling to feel part of a community, a part yeah. of a tribe, a part of our family system, or we feel sh- rejected and in shame, mm-hmm. right? Then you have love and connection, a desire to bond with another, and then self-esteem. And here's where mm-hmm. most people get stuck, right? Okay. So most people are coming in. So depression is most of the reasons people come in for this work is low self-esteem. I don't like myself. Okay. You know, and I don't trust myself and I'm not confident. So this, okay. the thing that you kind of shared, this person, mm-hmm. is they're needing more self-confidence and self-security. Okay. And so everybody's unconsciously trying to meet this need. Okay. So now. After that is self-actualization and the transcendence. Okay. Go and ahead, and ahead. Um, agency. What When I say to you, um, well, not when I say to you, how do you go about understanding what my needs are. Do you have a protocol? Do you have an intake sheet? Do you have a, you know, you converse? What what do you do? What's step number one? Yeah, definitely an intake sheet. And then a lot of intake, like calls, like therapeutic intake calls. But as I just mentioned, given the situation you just shared, it's largely a self-esteem issue, right? You're not feeling confident in yourself. You're not feeling secure of yourself there's a identification with the beliefs of like, Oh, my idea, my beliefs are okay. strong part. Okay. So I see, if I see this what person you're came in and they felt if they, if they felt very confident about their being and their life and very strong about it, they wouldn't have this issue. So sure. I'd be working with their identity about okay. who they think they are and who they okay. feel they are okay. and help them create a self healthy identity. Okay. Now in my uh, podcast, I've had at least three people come talking about confidence building specifically for women. They do it their own way. So what's, what is different about you? Uh, what would you, um, I mean, would you have a one-on-one coaching? Uh, would you give me say a menu like, uh, coaches give people who want to lose weight? Okay. First we're going to do this, 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 and this, how, or, or you ask me, I mean, wh- what do you do? Um, you know, of course you're pr- probably pretty flexible, but you must have sort of a a process that you go by or use, right? So when it comes to psychedelic work, there's prep sessions where we're doing a lot of this kind of processing work. Then there's the medicine experience and I can Uh go into that. Then there's integration to support the changes. And so during the, the first processing sessions, you know, I am definitely helping just getting all the intake and all the ideas, understanding their situation, mm-hmm. um, helping them be, build that sense of security, their self. Wow. And most people come into the. So I don't want to know your secrets. Identities... I just want yeah, yeah, to yeah, get yeah. a taste. So, yeah. The big secret is the medicine does most of the heavy, heavy lifting. Oh. Right. So that's just, so putting me aside, right? So mm. what tends to happen and this, cause I can tell you all, how I would do my work, right? Sure. But it's not as beautiful as what the mushrooms do. My, the, the, the mushrooms are more effective than mm-hmm. any human, right? Yeah. So I could tell you what I do. 
which is I'm happy to go into that, right? Yeah, but that, showing love, that's, connection, empathy. That's illegal, and you present, can't do that with me. You can't do that with me. So I do this work legally in Jamaica, right? So I can tell oh, you. What okay, we do over so there. You, you say take a plane, yeah, yeah. come over, and we'll see yeah, what we yeah, can do yeah, with you there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's so they tend to work as deconditioning agents. Okay. Right? And that's that. what happened with the 60s and 70s. People broke away sure. from their kind of religions and the government sure. and thought for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so there's deconditioning around beliefs and identity. And it seems to be a part of the consciousness itself wakes up. And mm -hmm. so they're easier to identify with ideas like love uh -huh. or that I'm enough. I've seen people snap out of 20 years of depression yeah. in a day. Mm -hmm. I've seen yeah. it pop out of heavy addiction in a day. Mm -hmm. And so no other form of therapy can really do that generally with these high mm -hmm. level of numbers. And so there's a lot of, I could share about the prep work, mm -hmm. but the real magic is th these states of consciousness. Uh -huh. We're so used to being in this rigid state. Sure. As that shifts, all the possibilities of, of these rigid selves mm -hmm. um, can dissolve. And so Stanislav Grof, he's been one of the biggest researchers mm -hmm. in this field for about 60 years. He said psychedelics catalyze what he calls holotropic states of consciousness, states that organically move towards wholeness, mm -hmm. right? So this person's consciousness moves into wholeness, mm -hmm. feeling less fragmented, right? So with that, they can walk around with some more security, some more confidence, and a deeper sense of self. All right. Now I've grilled you enough, my boy. <laughs> I'm going to ask you about your book, uh, Penguin Random House. What did you publish with them? A title. All right. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. The Psilocybin Connections and the name of the book. Subtitle is uh, Psychedelics, Consciousness, and the Transformation of the Planet and Inner okay. World Approach. I got, mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. I got uh, published by North Atlantic Books and it's distributed by Penguin Random House. Um, yeah. And I'm lucky because they're the biggest distributors sure. in the world. One of the five. Um, and North Atlantic mm -hmm. Books. Yeah. yeah, North Atlantic Books is uh is very progressive and they're open to psychedelics. Uh -huh. You know, so I'm really glad we formed a really good uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. And the book was, I felt since I was a teenager, I I needed to write a book. It was when something inside of me wanted to come out. When since I was a teen, yeah. No, yeah. no. When did so you publish I, I, it? The, the publish. publish it came out April 2022. So okay. it was just last year, recent a mm -hmm. year ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it was about a good five years of work of writing. So I read 75 books on psychedelics just for this I book, know, you know, I, I mean, you know and you books. will continue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is, that's what writing yeah, means. Yeah. 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 So, so it's. Do you have I mean, something so, up your sleeve I think now? Do you have something in the works for another book? Yeah. Starting to. Um, I've been thinking about another book for several years. And uh -huh. I was just gave myself a break before writing it. Sure. Because as you may know, it's so consuming. And so the next book I want to be called the uh, Psychedelic America. Mm, and going interesting. Now, this is once psychedelics become historic, a no, historic sorry. overview. Mm. Yeah, it, it, but a deep historic. So mm. Americans, there's indigenous people that came here about twenty thousand years ago, uh -huh. right? And there were seventy million Americans before the Europeans came okay. to the Americas, mm -hmm. and they were had a huge psychedelic culture. We have a lot of anthropological evidence. And so we had millions of people using psychedelics, mm -hmm. tracing back thousands of years before the Europeans. Yeah. And most of those practices and lineages were eradicated. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really contextualizing and using these models of psychedelic societies that had been around as deeply American, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and this, the, the prior book had to do with the emergence of humanity. It was a much right. deeper, larger scope. Mm -hmm. This one, I'm narrowing the scope to talk about North, Central and South America. Mm -hmm. So there's that. And then the future of psychedelics in the world also. Oh, that's another, or is that part of this new project? Part, yeah. It's going to go uh, present, past, and future. It's going to follow okay. the same flow of this last All right. book. Okay, good. But just kind of more narrow it in. Okay, that'll keep you off the streets. That's, I'm happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> Jahan, 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 thank you so much for coming and taking the time to gotta, talk to us and and talking to us about mm. such an um a topic that you don't hear uh, being talked about in a in a, an academic way in a, a specific way i appreciate that and i hope to have you back when you totally. maybe start that next book hmm? mm. maybe yeah i'm hoping to start this year this good year. Yeah, yeah good yeah Good. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. thank you. And I hope to see you again. Bye bye. Thank you. It's an honor. Thank you.